Okay, everybody, thank you all for tuning in today. I think uh, just in the interest of time and knowing this falls on pretty much everybody's lunch radar, uh, I'll go ahead and kick us off and hopefully we'll get some more folks tuning in. So thank you all for tuning in for the next installment of our Urban Water Innovation Network's Science Talk series. Uh, as a reminder, these presentations are focused on the key findings of our five-year research projects with an emphasis on pragmatic recommendations for stakeholders and practitioners. Last week, we shifted gears to focus on the impacts of innovative technology the technological solutions for urban water systems that are explored under Thrust B. Uh, so today we're going to continue on. Uh, as you know, we are recording each webinar and I post these to our YouTube channel as well as the UN website. Make sure everyone gets those links afterwards. Uh, most of you should have entered this webinar muted, uh, but we do hope to engage listeners with questions and discussions at the end of Dr. Charvel's Charvel's presentation. So please feel free to use the chat queue or turn on your mic and webcam once she's wrapped up. So with that, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Sybil Charvel, a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and director of the Interviews Graduate Program and Urban Water Center at Colorado State University. Her research interests include water reuse, such as gray water and reclaimed water, integrated urban water management, and waste conversion to energy. Sybil is currently working on development of models to estimate water savings associated with urban water conservation practices. Dr. Charvel also has several years of experience working on waste conversion to methane through anaerobic digestion. And Sybil, hello, good to see you. I know we can see you and hopefully hear you. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen, I'll pass it over to you. Sure, thank you, Sarah. Let me just take a minute and get my screen shared here. All right, so thank you for those of you participating today. Um, we'll be talking about uh, project B11A, which is enhanced capacity for use of alternate water sources. So this, I unfortunately cannot take credit for making this beautiful image. This is from National Geographic. Um, they had an issue on, um, on kind of uh, the city of the future and urban water and urban design and how that integrates with water. And this is an image from that National Geographic issue, which I would highly re recommend checking out if you haven't already. Um, but this shows kind of these clusters of these um, highly dense development areas. But in between those, you can see um, green and blue spaces, the green spaces being, you know, living things and ecosystems and, and, and waterways that are connected throughout the highly urbanized area so that there's um, green space to improve community livability and um, our stormwater and wastewater systems are kind of all integrated within this kind of community management um, where there's green roofs and rain gardens and things to manage uh, stormwater and promote infiltration of water. And then um, you can envision in these buildings or these clusters of buildings, um, which could be referred to as kind of districts, that there's um, potential for recycling of water within a building or um, even, even within, the, um, within one of those kind of circular clusters that you see. So um, lots of kind of innovative opportunities here for water and energy management, really. And um, just kind of doing a zoom down of what pictures of these systems really look like. Like we could have rain gardens for stormwater management. Um, this is a picture of green roofs and you can envision that we could take um, water from a from one of these buildings, maybe gray water and use that to irrigate uh, the, the rooftops here and create more green space. And then of course there's many different benefits in terms of water quality and carbon footprint and energy efficiency in the buildings as well. Um, this is a nice project that I like to showcase um, along these lines of uh, use of alternate water sources. So this is a project that you never would know exists. Um, I had the opportunity to visit this um, with the Washington DC uh, Parks Department and um, it's in the Washington Mall and like you can see on the photo on the right, um, you can't see that the system exists, but um, there's a storage tank under all of this area in the Washington Mall where they collect the stormwater from that area 
and um, they treat it and then they use it for spray, spray irrigation in that area. And um, so I think that's a nice example of a stormwater capture and use project that has been really successful. Um, some examples of these kind of building scale systems for use of alternate water sources. Um, I like to show these two buildings because they, these two buildings and the systems in those buildings because they represent kind of the diversity that we can see um, in, in these kinds of systems where San Francisco's public utilities has put in place um, this kind of natural based treatment system. So that plant um, planting that you see in kind of the next to the sidewalk of the building is actually a um, water treatment system that treats the wastewater. So wastewater flows underneath um, the soil system there and the root zone and things all help to, to treat the wastewater. And then it's used for toilet flushing in that building. There's some additional treatment systems, but this is a very this is an example of a very outward facing um, kind of project where it's really open for the public to see. Um, there's also um, some buildings in New York City, um, like the Solaire Building and Battery Park in New York, where you see kind of more design systems that are underground and a little bit less visible to the community and, and even um, residents of those buildings. But same thing here is happening where we're taking wastewater from the building and um, treating that and recycling it for use in toilet flushing. And you can see there that there's also a green roof on top of that building that's actually irrigated also with the, the treated water. So just some examples of what these kind of systems can look like. Um, so we talk a lot about fit for purpose water and what does that mean? So I like to think about it as the right water for the right use. Um, I've written here, appropriate treatment of water based on the source water and end use combination. So there's all sorts of different sources of water that we can think about. Some of those that I just talked about, like we can take total wastewater, um, we can separate gray water. So we can um, separate water from laundry machines and shower washing, for example, which is a little cleaner water source. Um, there's storm water, which we can capture from rooftops and have roof runoff, or we can collect that storm water from larger areas. And all of those waters come with very different quality. And then um, there's many different potential end uses for those water sources too. Everything from using them in a toilet, irrigation, we can think about very low human contact uses where we're using drip irrigation systems, um, but all the way to the highest quality required um, for potable quality. So we have to kind of think about what is our source water, what's the end use, and um, maybe not every water needs to be treated to, to potable quality so that we can um, kind of think about how we can be efficient with energy and um, water recovery in these systems and treat water that's appropriate um, based on the exposures associated with end uses. So when we refer to fit for purpose water, that's really what we're talking about. Um, I showed some of these um, smaller scale systems. Um, water recycling and use can happen from everywhere from a single residence to the municipal scale. And there's considerations associated across those different scales that make them really different. Um, in, in a single residence, we can think about gray water systems and often um, roof runoff or um, the, what people really like to call those as rainwater systems. Um, I, from a hydrologic perspective, I like to call them roof runoff better. Um, then the, we have the multi-residential and commercial scale, or maybe even um, a neighborhood you could envision where we can kind of uh, collect building from multiple, or, sorry, we can collect water from multiple different residences and be able to make use of that all the way up to the municipal scale water where we can integrate with our um, centralized collection and distribution systems and we can do that for either stormwater or treated effluent. So kind of as we looked at, there's a lot of different uh, water sources we can use, a lot of different scales, and there's a lot of questions um, around even though we've had systems like this implemented, we still have a lot of questions around um, the most appropriate and best practices and, and how we can make these systems most efficient. So for example, how much demand um, for additional water sources uh, can be reduced via the alternate sources and how do those different um, sources work to achieve efficiency? Um, what are trade-offs between cost and efficacy of water conservation and reuse strategies? 
Um, what is the impact of implementation of fit for purpose water strategies on sustainability indicators? So how, what's kind of, if we look at the um, broader community livability perspectives, um, how, how do these kind of practices help us to um, achieve more sustainable and livable communities? And um, there's still a lot of um, uh, debate around what are the appropriate levels of treatment to really achieve these fit for purpose uses. I talked about fit for purpose use being um, right treatment for the right use, but, but um, scientifically there's still a lot of questions around what is the quality that was really needed to, to serve those goals? So the research that we conducted for UN um, really uh, sought to answer some of these questions um, with these various different objectives. Um, we wanted to assess various scales and configurations of water management solutions, um, estimate impacts of alternative water management solutions to improve sustainability indicators, and um, we found there were a lot of questions around roof runoff quality and treatment required for roof runoff. So we um, wanted to also assess uh, microbial quality of roof runoff for fit for purpose use. Okay, so kind of just diving straight into results here. Um, this graphic on the left here shows um, different strategies for water conservation and reuse. So it includes strategies like um, indoor conservation, which is noted as IC. And so all these different um, nomenclatures for these strategies are noted on the right side. Um, it's kind of difficult to follow, but there's not enough space really to be able to write all of these strategies. Um, so you can look at the side on the right to kind of get um, what those are. Um, but anyway, we looked at uh, water conservation strategy and kind of a water efficiency, as well as use of these alternate sources. So we have the different um, water sources, gray water, storm water, wastewater, and roof runoff, and um, making use of those for different end uses. So two that really stuck out for when we looked at um, kind of uh, assessing these in terms of cost and efficacy, um, were efficient irrigation systems and stormwater for irrigation. So these, this graphic is showing the frequency that these strategies showed up um, in, um, in the optimal solutions. We kind of combined all these different strategies together and looked at different scenarios and looked at um, optimizing both costs, so minimizing costs and maximizing the, the potential for um, demand reduction for traditional water supplies and found that um, across these three study cities, Denver, Miami, and Tucson, it was clear that the um, efficient irrigation systems and stormwater for irrigation were ones that um, very frequently appeared. And what we mean by um, efficient irrigation systems would be uh, installing sprinkler heads that are more efficient, maybe converting to drip irrigation systems, um, looking at how we can make our irrigation systems more efficient. So stormwater was one that really popped out from that graphic and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about stormwater moving forward as well. Um, this table is kind of a lot to digest, but the color coding is really helpful. So. Um, we've got these three study cities again, Denver, Miami, and Tucson. Um, and we have the different strategies like cli climate appropriate landscape or zero scape, um, efficient irrigation systems, um, those different water efficiency strategies. And then below the alternative source strategies where we have the different source water and end use combinations. So looking at the left side here is the um, efficacy of these four demand reductions. So those that are indicated in more green are those that achieve more demand reduction. And we really readily see kind of that these green areas in, in the demand reduction component um, are all coming from stormwater. And um, that stormwater can be in a really effective source, even in arid climates. If we, if we have the right storage, even in arid climates like Denver and Tucson, we can achieve um, really high demand reduction, more so in Miami with um, the high impervious area and, and higher precipitation. Um, there's, there's more potential for demand reduction there, but even in cities like Tucson and Denver, um, the stormwater is 
rising to the top in terms of being one of the strategies that really does a lot to impact our um, demand for traditional supplies. Um, then, however, looking at costs, um, what we have for costs over here for De Denver, Miami, Tucson, these are total annualized costs over, um, including, you know, kind of the life cycle costs of these. Um, the highest cost is also associated with the stormwater uh, projects and in each of these cities. So we have a lot of potential to meet demands using stormwater, but based on current costs, that it does come with a cost associated. Still, we see stormwater um, rising to the top when we optimize for for uh, uh, cost and and um, efficacy for demand reduction because it's so very effective for um, demand reduction. And a lot of these costs, I think that can be can be reduced. Um, we don't really have standards of practice for stormwater capture and use systems yet. And um, as more of those systems are installed and there's better standards of practice and um, um, kind of engineering design, then uh, I would expect that some of these costs go down, but some of them are just inherent to the storage requirement for, for stormwater. So we also, for all of these different strategies, looked at some of these sustainability indicators. And the ones that, and this is um, something that's really core to the Urban Water Innovation Network is, is kind of understanding how different solutions impact um, these different sustainability indicators. And um, I have on the left over here, these indicator categories um, that are most relevant for thinking about these um, water conservation and reuse strategies. So we looked at the indicator categories that we looked at were things like um, reduced demand for traditional water supplies, um, health impacts, um, energy efficiency, uh, potential for reduced flow downstream. So that's a really big concern in um, states like Colorado where there's um, water rights that we have to think about and um, how these different strategies may affect downstream users. Um, in other areas, there's a lot of concern over combined sewer overflow and sometimes diverting stormwater or even wastewater from the sewer systems can help with combined sewer overflow impacts. Um, public perception, employment opportunity, um, just public awareness of efficient water use and the visibility of these projects, and then green space and some of the benefits associated with that. So these were kind of, um, through a literature review, these were the um, set of indicators that we found to be relevant for these water conservation and reuse practices. And we looked at each of these through a triple bottom line lens. So thinking about the social, economic, and environmental considerations associated with each of these indicators. And so I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, the point is really that we went through and were thoughtful about for each of these indicator categories, how could there be each social, economic, and environmental benefits associated with that particular indicator category? And then we had sets of metrics that, that came from our modeling that we used to, um, to rate all of these different, um, uh, the different water conservation and reuse strategies in terms of their performance for the indicator categories. Okay, so here's some of those results, and um, we actually have separated here the social, economic, and environmental scores. Um, this is from a multi-criteria decision method called PROMETHI. Um, this is the PROMETHI method uses a pairwise comparison to evaluate strategies and comes up with a score between negative one and one um, for, for the performance in, in the various indicator categories. Um, so where you see the negative values, those are strategies that did not um, score as well compared to other strategies and where there's positive values or um, um, more, the more positive or higher value positive that we have are um, the, the strategies that scored well, scored the best. Um, here, just glancing at this right away, we can see that these stormwater strategies are really doing well in terms of these sustainability indicators as well. Um, this study was actually done only for Denver, so I should note that. And so, for example, we don't have combined sewer overflow issues in Denver, so that was not considered as an indicator, but the downstream flow considerations were, were really important here. Um, 
and still stormwater, you know, surfacing very much to the to the top here in terms of, of performance in terms of these different um, sustainability indicators. So kind of looking at the ones, the five strategies that did best, um, four of those five were um, all related, all me used um, stormwater for different end uses. Like you just saw, those were just the strategies that really we're doing well. Um, the spider plot just shows um, kind of a normalized uh, performance in these different areas related to demand reduction, um, potential for reduced flow downstream, energy efficiency, um, possible health impacts, and then um, public perception. So um, you can just kind of see here some of the trade-offs that occur here, like for example that um, the the strategy that the roof runoff or toilet flushing and irrigation does not do as much to reduce demand, um, but the, the potential health imp impacts from um, possible exposures to that water are, are less than some of these other um, strategies and um, energy efficiency is really, really good. So you can kind of look at this to see trade-offs between these, these different strategies. So kind of um, coming back to these questions, we um, have talked about the first three bubbles, which is well, the dark green, purple, and blue, um, related to kind of the sustainability impacts and um, trade-offs between cost and efficacy for these different practices. Um, but we are also really interested in thinking about overcoming some of the barriers associated with um, uh, use, of the, use of alternate sources and understanding the appropriate level of treatment. And that motivated this Off the Roof Citizen Science Project, which was just um, an amazingly fun project to be engaged in. Um, this was a project that we engaged citizens to collect uh, samples from, from, their, from their residences or even sometimes a couple of schools. And um, we, would, we were measuring quality of, of that collected water, particularly related to the microbial quality to inform some of these treatment standards. So let's talk a little bit more about why, why do we do this? Why the focus on roof runoff and not the other sources? Um, this is a um, report that, uh, in which I was um, the, the chair of a panel that uh, looked at providing guidance for decentralized non-potable water systems. So thinking about these building and district scale systems, um, what's kind of the, the guidance that's needed for for ensuring public health um, outcomes are met. And a large part of this effort was um, these, the large outcome and output from this effort was these recommendations of log reduction targets. So log reduction targets tell you um, the, the, amount, the, the, the amount of logs that you need to reduce of um, virus, protozoa, and bacteria. So the pathogenic organisms, um, to meet acceptable level of risk based on the end use. Um, so what you can see here on the left is the different water use scenarios. So we have storm water, gray water, wastewater, um, roof runoff, and then for each virus, protozoa, and bacteria, there's a log reduction to um, achieve appropriate level, appropriate water quality for, for, again, what we would consider to be um, an acceptable level of risk for exposure. So you can see in all of these that um, unrestricted irrigation um, uh, has typically, well, always a lower treatment requirement in terms of pathogen reduction compared to indoor use where there's a higher potential for exposure to that water. Um, so in doing this effort, we synthesized a lot of data and ran these quantitative microbial risk assessment models, but um, there was a huge gap in roof runoff water quality. Um, and there was no data to support development of, uh, of log reduction targets for protozoa. And um, for enteric bacteria, we had to use some um, kind of epidemiological models rather, rather than actual data of collected on, on roof runoff. So this was identified as a gap. And that's what really motivated our study um, that was a citizen science project on collecting roof runoff. 
Um, so we engage citizens in roof runoff sampling that um, will inform public on use of alternative water sources while also collecting data on microbial water quality to better inform treatment targets for roof runoff for various end uses. Um, so like I said, we engage a, um, a set of um, citizens and homeowners and, and teachers from schools to, to help us to collect all these different roof runoff samples across the country. Um, our study areas were Tucson, Arizona, um, Fort Collins, I have that indicated as Denver, but all of our um, sampling efforts actually ended up being in Fort Collins, um, Baltimore, and Miami. So this gave us a pretty good um, geographical spread of, of, um, of areas and potential different quality that could be associated with climate and um, differences in, in um, city buildings and species, animal species and all those kinds of things in those, in those different areas. So in each of these areas, we had um, seven participants in each of the study cities. We had seven participants that collected samples from their home at least um, four times different during the four different seasons. So the participants collected samples. Um, they were trained on um, how they, they actually installed their roof, their roof runoff systems, their, their rain barrels and, and the collection systems. Um, we provided instructional videos to them on how to install those systems and um, then gave them a whole lot of materials, um, written materials and video training on how to collect samples. And they collected all the samples and then took observations during their studies. And um, then students in each of our study um, cities would go and pick up those samples from participants and process them in their lab and then send them either to US EPA for analysis or um, to CSU, depending on the analytes. This is the off the this is the sitsi.org website that supported the off the roof project. Um, Greg Newman was involved and in, at Colorado State University and um, helped to develop the site. And you can see here um, you have a lot of different questions for the participants about both the rainfall event and making sure that they followed the correct protocol for for collecting their samples as well. Um, so this was a really useful tool. Um, the, the participants, there was very high success of participants actually filling this out. And um, we had very high success of them following all of the protocols as well, which were quite extensive since we were doing pathogen analysis. We were trying to avoid any possible contamination of the roof runoff samples with um, pathogens that weren't from the roof runoff. So that was it's really important in this study to have them follow this extensive protocol. Okay, so some of the results from this, this shows some of the different um, pathogens that we assess. So Salmonella, Campylobacter, um, and we have G Giardia and Cryptosporidium, so the protozoa. And um, what you can see is the, the um, frequency that these were uh, um, detected in these different study cities. And then the darker rad means a higher concentration of those particular um, organisms. So we really found um, bacterial samples only, uh, bacterial pathogen samples that we looked at were only present in Fort Collins and Miami, but um, they appeared, Salmonella was in 8.8% of our samples overall, um, Campylobacter 2.5%. Um, so there, there are potentially human infectious pathogens to be that are found in, in roof runoff. Um, concentrations are not highly different from surface water. So um, users can kind of think of this water as surface water that you, you want to just drink without treatment, but um, it, it also doesn't come with a, a particularly high risk associated with it either. So kind of coming back to these log reduction targets and um, the, the lack of data that was there and kind of how things have changed based on the results that we've, we've looked at from the study. Um, if we look at the roof runoff and unrestricted irrigation and indoor use, um, there was no data to inform the uh, uh, log reduction targets for protozoa. Um, and we now found data and we did find presence of protozoa, um, particularly uh, the Giardia species, if we look back here. And ultimately that tells us we, we need to treat 
roof runoff for protozoa for end uses. Um, these are very low log reduction targets compared if you remember the table I showed before, a lot of those log reduction targets were kind of in the range of four, five, six, four to eight, let's say. So these are these are very low, but but still present and important as we think about exposures. Um, so we were able to provide a, a log reduction target for protozoa, and that was important because a lot of the regulatory community, when they made use of our 2017 guidance, um, since there was no data, they just assumed that protozoa weren't very important and didn't really design um, require, uh, designers weren't really thinking about protozoa and how they put together treatment processes for treatment of roof runoff. Um, and then for bacteria, we found that, you know, we, we made a lot of conservative assumptions when we use the epidemiological models and we're able to revise those to be a little bit less conservative and require um, less treatment of bacteria. So um, the state of California is um, now making use of, of this data as it's revising and, and coming up with a new set of regulations for um, on-site water systems. So um, this, this is actually going directly into um, regulatory frameworks. And um, this is a paper that still is not published yet, but that um, is forthcoming that describes all of this data. And large number of authors, because um, we had so many collaborators from our UN uh, um, network and um, also from US EPA. So this was just a really nice collaborative effort. And in that light, we learned not only did this project inform um, kind of these regulations with respect to, to roof runoff, um, also we learned a lot about citizen science and, and a unique element of this project with citizen science was that it was, it, re it was really burdensome for our participants. A lot of citizen science projects are just, you know, maybe asking people to go out and count bees or, um, collect a, a rain sample and measure the, the depth of that. This really required extensive time input for um, participants to be ready for our sampling events and to follow all the correct protocol that needed to happen. And so I think we learned a lot about kind of some of the, I would say barriers and bridges for, for conducting these kind of complex citizen science projects that have ex demanding requirements for participants. Um, one of that was selection of engaged citizens. Um, we found groups of, of uh, people that were really interested in this project, and um, we the, the the next bullet down is is participate coordination is really important. We had on our project um, hired individuals at their sole job. There was Greg Newman who took care of the site. Um, Alicia Kroll was our participant coordinator and um, really spent a lot of time and effort to reach out to participants, ans answer their questions, um, find engaged individuals to participate. And um, that was a large reason that we were successful. And because these uh, participants were so interested in our projects, um, we found sharing of results with them and keeping them up to date on what was happening with the project and what was happening with our results really helped keep them engaged. Um, they they got to they got a lot of support in setting up these rain barrel kits and they got to keep that equipment. So that was kind of um, a bonus that I think helped to keep them engaged in the project. Um, but probably most important was the UN network itself um, and having uh, our, our research network where we had collaborators in each of our study cities that could help with this project. So um, there's, so, so we had um, a UNPI in each of our study cities that were co-authors on that manuscript and um, they and their students helped to go out and collect these samples and um, when the, the local participants had an issue, we would have them get in touch with the, the students and PI in their, in their local area, which made a, made a lot of difference. And so having this existing network in place um, to support this project was really um, ended up to be beneficial. And I'm not sure how we could have been successful with this project without those kind of um, partnerships that happen through UN. Okay, so that's um, 
that's kind of what I have here. Let's just kind of summarize the key findings that, that impact practice. Um, stormwater capture and use has large potential for reduced demand of traditional supplies. It also um, uh, com, uh, performs really well with respect to these sustainability indicators, but it does come at a high cost. And, um, and then and there's barriers with respect to the, the regulatory process. Um, and, uh, and like I said, we don't have the existing standards of practice in place for either design or regulation of these systems. Um, it, I, my recommendation would be that it's, it's worth it to, to overcome some of those barriers and, and do the work to uh, kind of guide the regulatory process and develop standards of practice because, um, like I said, it's, it's a practice that has a lot of potential for um, demand reduction and also comes with these other benefits um, that, that can be considered. So um, that's kind of a big lesson learned, I think, from this project is the value in stormwater capture and use projects. Um, kind of going on to the other component of the project, which, which, which was respect to the fit for purpose uh, water and water quality. Um, this data was collected on roof runoff quality through this uh, citizen science effort, and that's now being used to inform regulations for treatment requirements. So um, I think that's been a real success of our project as well. And um, this, just the citizen science component of it that I talked about also has been, I think, um, really beneficial to, to the community working in citizen science. So with that, I would like to go ahead and take questions. Great, thank you, Sybil. I always love hearing about your work. Maybe it's because it's something that I'm familiar enough with that I understand a lot of pieces <laughs> being a non-engineer. Um, I did have a question. If anybody else does, feel free to throw, throw it in the chat queue or turn your um, webcam and mic on. So for the, uh, the salmonella statistics that you presented, were those based on, for the roof runoff project, were those primarily like zoonotic or, or just human mm -hmm. pathogens or is that all salmonella species? Thank you, Sarah. That was a good question and very important. So these particular salmonella species are, um, are uh, and, and Campylobacter, these, they, they, everything comes from, we, these roofs had no human contact. So they're all zoonotic pathogens but there are ones that also are potentially human infectious pathogens. So all of the pathogens that we studied here are zoonotic, meaning that they come from animals, but they have potential to make humans ill. Um, so all of the species, so these are very specific um, species of Salmonella and Campylobacter that are zoonotic, but that have potential for um, making humans ill. That's what I thought, but I wasn't. I wasn't sure. No, that was a great question. I, I, I. That's really important consideration um, with these pathogens and whether you're kind of characterizing the entire group. It's, it's really important to note that um, all of these um, have to come from uh, animal sources because we don't have human uh, presence on these roofs. But these all are human infectious pathogens. Great. Thank you. That was that was just my one thing that popped up. Anybody else have questions for Sybil? Hi. Hi. I have a question. Maybe it's not directly related to this, but because I'm working on the water allocation balance itself. So maybe what's the effect of excessive use of runoff on maybe on the overall water balance? Maybe does this mm. affect the water rights? Does this affect the return fluids, the streams? So or it just yes. small stuff that just can be used to reduce the urban demand from streams. Yep, let me share my screen again. Okay. <laughs> so um, it depends on whether we're talking about stormwater or reef runoff. So just kind of um, going back here, for some reason, let's see, escape. Uh, let's go back, oops, wow, here. On this graph again, we so does these stormwater uh, percentages are in the top here. Um, these have uh, stormwater when you so when you collect all of the stormwater, so not just roof runoff, but from parking lots, streets, etc. 
that has a lot of potential to impact downstream users and a lot of potential to impact water demand as mm -hmm. well. Um, when we talk about roof runoff, these percentages oh. are very, very small. So when okay. we just collect roof runoff, um, there's not a lot of potential for water demand reduction. This is consistent with what other studies have found. Mm -hmm. um, I would say though, still, there's a lot of benefit in roof runoff capture projects and just kind of the public uh, outreach component. And it makes people very much more aware of how much water that they really use when they get this uh -huh. 55 gallon barrel and it doesn't even get filled in a, in a in a rain event that feels somewhat large and then they're trying to use that to irrigate in their yard it makes them have a lot more understanding of how far water takes so i think roof runoff is really important from a um kind of public outreach perspective uh -huh. It doesn't have very much impact on demand, which it, the, these all kind of translate to how yes. much impact it is has on the downstream as well. Um, I've seen some estimates in Colorado that show with roof runoff, you know, there's there's um, enough, like the, the amount of water that you would divert even with pretty large levels of roof runoff um, would likely be evaporated by the time it makes it, it down to <laughs> downstream users. So there's not a lot of impact there. Now, when we go to stormwater, there is a large potential impact to downstream users by, by diverting that and making use of it in the community. Um, something to consider there though, is that um, you're also potentially withdrawing less from your uh, water supply sources as well. And that could be used to meet some of those downstream requirements. And that, that was considered Again, in these sustainability indicators, we looked for like this potential potential for down for flow downstream, um, impact on downstream water supply, impacts to downstream recreation, agriculture, industry, and that um, took into account how much water was being diverted and not being returned to the system because of these practices. So stormwater scored poorly in these areas, but still all the other benefits of it made it score high overall. Yes. Yeah. So it may have like a behavioral uh, increase the awareness of people to reduce their per capita demand, like because yeah. we are we are collecting our own water. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I realized I had one other question that popped up. Um, so when you were talking about restricted irrigation mm. for stormwater use, was that did that in involve just restricting what types of plants, like I'm assuming non-food crops, or is that more complicated than what I'm thinking? So that terminology is really commonly used for reclaimed water. It's restricted and unrestricted. It's actually related to the access to the area. So unrestricted access irrigation means that um, like the, the system we looked at in Washington, D.C., is a great example of unrestricted access irrigation. Um, people can go with spraying, people go play out in that park. They're, they're very concerned about the quality of water there because of the high exposure rates. And we have unrestricted, that means public access at all times. When you have restricted access irrigation, that's places that maybe are fenced up or sometimes we can characterize some areas um, if they irrigate at night, and there's some control on public access during those nighttime hours. Um, those can also be considered uh, can be considered restricted access, and the level of treatment is much lower for unrestricted access versus um, for the level. Sorry, the level of treatment is much lower for restricted access versus unrestricted access. Thank you. I knew I knew it wasn't as simple as I was thinking. <laughs> Well, yeah, just different. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, well, I haven't seen anything else pop up in the chat queue yet. So thank you for your time, Sybil. Oh, hey, Brian. Hey there, Sybil. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sybil. Thank you for uh, the great talk, Sybil. Um, this is a question maybe out of left field, but as you were talking about, all the efficiencies and opportunities there with irrigation water. It started me to thinking about our friends on Thrust A and their work on urban heat islands. Mm. 
and I'm and I'm just wondering, kind of what the state of the practice is, or have you have you seen many innovations where um, maybe cities intentionally used the stormwater capture uh, for urban cooling as another uh, use of, of that water. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And this is something that we're really interested in looking at and have started a collaboration with Ellie um, and from Princeton on um, kind of looking at, okay, so, um, and this was one of our, our indicator categories is green yeah. space here. Um, yeah. So this is something that is really important and increased green space does have these thermal comfort impacts. Um, in particular, we were interested in looking at this in areas in disadvantaged communities in Denver where um, they have yards, but the yards turn brown or they're just dirt in, in the summertime. And, and we were wondering kind of, okay, well, what's, we think a lot about, um, you know, these, let's, you know, to add more green space, but what if we use these alternate sources to supply that green space? And I think stormwater is a, a really great example of one that could be collected, treated, and, and readily used in these kinds of settings and um, increase our irrigation, but do that with a, a, an alternate water source that we're not impacting, not putting potable water on the, on the area and, um, and, and um, also that, that's really highly treated and not depleting our other water sources and, and kind of get these benefits around livability and thermal comfort and potentially even biodiversity. Um, I haven't seen yet a project implemented that actually had that as a primary driver. I've seen it noted as a benefit, but I haven't seen a driver of a project to be um, increased green space using stormwater for or an alternate water source for um, for these kind of livability and thermal comfort considerations. However, I think it's a really important considerations and we're hoping to eventually be able to publish some of this work that we do with Ellie where we can look at um, in these areas and, and are in some disadvantaged communities in Denver and, and really look at what could be the impact of, of using stormwater in those areas on thermal comfort benefits based on kind of taking their yards that are dead grass and irrigating those to, to make, um, you know, uh, green spaces that support ecosystems and thermal comfort. So forthcoming. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you, Brian. You too. Yes, I, I second that. Nice to see you, Brian. Well, in the uh, interest of time, because I'm sure everybody else has another meeting in 10 minutes, we'll uh, go ahead and wrap up. I'll get this video posted to the website and YouTube channel. And we hope to see you all next week. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a great afternoon. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.